Hello everyone, Nightmare here, and this is Whale FM's Fireside Chat with Artists. In this show, we talk about everything and anything art and crypto in the NFT scene with designers and creators alike, otherwise known as non-fungible tokens. Our special guests today are Maddie Mo, aka the most famous artist, the LA-based American conceptual artist and digital provocateur, infamous for pushing boundaries, perception, and social media to new heights, and Dr. Sarkis Masmanian, an award-winning professor of microbiology whose research on the interaction between the gut microbiome and the brain are unlocking new potential treatments and understanding for neurologic and immunologic disorders. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you guys have a very interesting drop coming up um, that is altruistic in nature and trying to raise awareness for something very uh, important in the scientific research community and likewise um, is kind of pushing the boundaries of, of NFTs and how they've been presented thus far. So excited to have you guys on and talk directly to our whale community and the whale DAO. Um, but before we get into that, we'd just like to give a, a little synopsis on, on each of you. Maddie, could you just give us a little background on who is the most famous artist? Sure. So the most famous artist is a conceptual art project I started uh, in 2013. Uh, if you Google the most famous artist, you find me next to Picasso and Warhol. Um, maybe we could do that live if you go to Google uh, and type in the most famous artist. Uh, you will see, there he is, Matty Mo next to Picasso. And that happened because I realized that I could use headline worthy art projects to generate backlinks to the brand, the most famous artist, and therefore raise my ranking to be the actual most famous artist. Right now, I run a community of artists all over the world. We have our own social token called Artcoin based on the Rally platform. And the stated goal of the most famous artists is to help accelerate the careers of 10,000 independent artists without needing to participate in the traditional art world. Um, that's that's uh, that's the summary of me. Very cool, Dr. Sarkis. Could you just give a little bit of background on on what your specialty is and what you're doing in the field of research? Sure. Uh, I'm a microbiologist by training, so I've studied bacteria for the past 25 years. Uh, for the first five years of which I studied the, the bad ones, the ones that make us sick, and then I had an epiphany about 20 years ago that there are all these good bacteria in our intestines. Very few people were studying them. No one really knew why they were there or what they were doing. And so this sounded like a challenge that, that intrigued me um, and haven't looked back. So it was one of the early uh, pioneers are the investigators in this space now referred to as the microbiomes. I like to say that I was working on the microbiome before it was cool, but now uh, a lot of people uh, hear about this. You hear about uh, about gut bacteria and probiotics um, uh, all around uh, from from you know uh, all sorts of media. And we've become interested uh, in the gut brain con connection. This evolved over many years of research, where um, initially we looked at the effects of how gut bacteria shape the immune system. That's a little bit more obvious when you think about bacteria and its relationship with, with um, immunity. But less obvious at the time and gaining a lot of uh, attention now is the interactions between bacteria in the gut and the brain. Again, this captivated our interests uh, and we've been working on how bacteria can control our thoughts, can control behavior, potentially even control diseases of the brain. And again, really, you know, inspiring work and happy to contribute to, 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 to this uh, forum. Awesome. So, so great to have you here with us to be able to talk uh, specifically to the science of it. Um, Maddie, if we could just a little bit, how would you care for anyone not familiar with your art, despite you being the most famous artist and so prevalent on search engines and whatnot, how would you characterize your artwork and what you do? I like to make large scale participatory spectacles. Uh, Duchamp famously said, the artist makes the work and the viewer finishes it. And as a result of the internet, you can facilitate or build scaffolding for large scale participation. Um, so that either comes in the form of art of viewers taking pictures inside of my installations or participating in the like this private jet experience that I that I created. Um, it's quite literally a facsimile to a private jet. Um, I wanted to kind of like challenge the idea that uh, 
being on a private jet on social media was a status symbol and and kind of dismantle the the social hierarchy that people were using social media to create through sharing like you know their fancy vacations um so this was quite a success it traveled all over the country was shown at art basel um, and many thousands of people took pictures inside of it um we've also done things like uh you might have seen these monoliths pop up all over the world because we've got this global distributed studio and community of artists we're able to do things on a global scale um so when the first monolith was discovered shortly there thereafter it was revealed that our collective, the most famous artist, had something to do with it. Um, we weren't able to admit that we did the whole thing, but we were able to provide enough digital artifacts to demonstrate we were clearly involved in some capacity and hundreds of news articles followed. Um, I don't know if you have any other things yeah. you can point out, but- I, Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's 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 so much to talk about here and what you, and what you do. Um, and I think the genesis of it is kind of important. So, you know, in the art world, you're often discussed for a number of reasons, but really, you know, you provoke a lot of discussion and talk about what is art, what is social status and things of that nature. And a lot of um, your projects that you've done have gained headlines uh, that run the gamut from very positive for being thought provoking to to being, you know, disparaging almost to the art movement. Right. But at importantly, it's causing conversation for people to evaluate these different paradigms of, of how they um, hold social status, of what what is valuable in art and things of that nature. Um, and the genesis of how you got to that point, I find very interesting. But, you know, for for like you said, for background for everybody between, you know, the selfie wall installations that you had created to, you know, um, the pink houses in LA that everyone had gone to and, and made pilgrimages to um, and a lot of headline grabbing projects. There's a lot of discussion about Maddie Mo in the art world. That's right. Let's go back to that that cash brick project. That one's kind of a fun one, and it's a good analog for what we're doing here. I saw people posting on social media, literally these bricks of cash, and thought to myself, I could very easily construct a sculpture called $100,000 for far less than $100,000 using legal US tender, or at least the perception of a sculpture that amounted to $100,000. So the idea was I offered a sculpture that looked like $100,000, was 1,000 legal bills of US currency serialized, and you were one of the deliverables was you got an Excel document with a serial of every single bill in the document, uh, in, in the sculpture. It was then saran wrapped so, and, and then placed, a, a perforated sticker was placed on top of it. So it brought into question like the value of the object itself, was it actually $100,000 or was it the bare minimum, which is $1,198, 998 ones and one 100 on each end. Um, and were people buying the art for the speculative bet that it could be $100,000 or were they buying it because of the message it sent? And so I was able to sell through uh, 10 of these plus two artist proofs um, and at one point I dragged 10 of these bricks through an art fair in a transparent bag with a bodyguard and filmed myself doing that and the reaction I got from the art world and then juxtaposed that with me walking through an art fair as, a, as, as an artist asking for help. And there was a stark difference between the reception uh, of me as an artist versus me as a wealthy collector. Um, that, that video went on to get something like 17 million views on Facebook and um, kind of brought me to the forefront of this discussion around like what is art and what are the value structures of art, the art market. Right. And I, and I love, you know, part of the inspiration for that was the, the situation that Bow Wow had gone through. I remember that specifically, right? So Bow Wow was a hip hop artist and I think he had taken some photos for Instagram where he was in a private jet. He had, you know, wads of cash and it came out later that it was staged specifically for Instagram. And, uh, you know, your reaction to it was, you know, what does this say about our perception of wealth and social status, you know, and by the same token, how can we leverage this to, have more messaging and have the discussion and go viral with it so um a lot of thought provoking things to you know bring trojan horse i think is the good analogy to bring things into the conversation that wouldn't get there otherwise right um and and i think 
you, the genesis of how you became in this vein to try to provoke that discussion is an important aspect of who you are as an artist. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Are you referring to my previous career as a tech founder and my segue into my art career? Yeah. I mean, I, I if you don't mind, I, I could give sure. a, you know, yeah, a brief, let's, let's, let's get into it. Yeah, um, I'll give a little cliff notes, right? And then you can indulge us with a little more detail where you think is relevant. So sure. um, my understanding, you know, you, you were involved in wrestling, you were an athlete when you were younger. Um, you, you uh, eventually in school were working for a wakeboarding magazine as well, right? You were making videos there and uploading them to YouTube. You and some friends found a way to gamify that a little bit and get a lot of views. Um, eventually parlayed that into a spot at 20th Century Fox at an internship. And, you know, obviously that was very valuable at the time, trying to get a presence on YouTube, get on the front page. Um, at the same time, you know, your wrestling talents, you were able to leverage that and land in Stanford. Uh, good so far yeah you're, you're doing great okay uh, okay yeah so, so i mean there's a lot there's a there's a lot to it so let me let me just uh give a give the cliff notes and then we can indulge a little bit so at stanford um you and some friends found share through right trying to um you know build social media presence and, and that was a big business there um you had a contribution to that you moved to new york to work at a big advertising company you were wicked good at what you do and uh, you were persuaded by a lot of these wealthy investors people around you hey why don't you start a business so you did you started alpha boost a ton of uh you know investor capital was injected people believed in you in the project you were very successful you're on the precipice of selling and getting a huge payout for all of your employees and then what happens then i went on a vacation to india uh the loi was signed uh i was about to sell my company it was a facebook advertising technology business um and i had a little bit too much fun and I got filmed stumbling around drunk and naked on a beach in India. And that became a gawker headline. And I became known as the drunk naked founder. And what that, what that did to me was it absolutely ruined my career as a technologist because I had let down all these investors. It kind of dismantled my team. They went from shopping for Ferraris to wondering, are they going to even have a job moving forward? I went back to my investor community and said, hey, we can keep this going. It's a good business. Um, and they said, well, why did you want to sell it in the first place? I said, well, you know, there's X, Y and Z reasons and realized that it wasn't going to be easy to raise subsequent funding to, you know, continue to build the business. Um, and so I, I had to shut it down. And I went from this backseat operator, like hiding in the background, making things happen to a headline. And I realized that that's what the news media was looking for was headlines that force people, whether by a, by, by a intrigue or by a spectacle to click on something in the newsfeed and redirect that person to that publisher's website to make money off of ads. And so I started to play around with this as the medium through which I make art. Um, and coincidentally, moving from technology into art, I typed in how to become the most famous artist. And I realized there were a ton of people described as the verb, the most famous artist, but no one had taken the noun. Um, and so that's when I decided to become the most famous artist. And for the last, let's call it eight years, I've been practicing art uh, independent of the art institution with a particular mindset towards technology uh, and marketing. And in the last two, three years, have really started to cultivate community, realizing there's a lot of other artists out there who didn't go through their traditional steps of go to an art school, get an MFA, work with a gallery. And that's because of the democratic effects of software and the ability for anyone to be able to make and distribute their work to their own audience. Um, so our community is, is called the most famous artists with an S on the end. Uh, we have a social token. We're moving towards a soft, like we're, we're a soft DAO right now. We're moving towards ha having implemented more governance into our um, our community. Uh, we've done quite a lot of NFT projects, one of which was quite successful. Um, we recognized that Beeple was about to launch with uh, Christie's. And so we knew that that would be a headline moment. So we actually, as a community, created 50 portraits of the same image of people in our own styles and then listed them as a collection. And that collection has sold around 480 ETH to date and sits in the top 50 projects of all time on OpenSea. 
Um, we've also done projects with Elon Musk's portrait and Grimes's portrait. Um, and so what's kind of cool about being in a community of artists is we're able to answer each other's questions and we're able to accelerate each other's adoption of stuff and new technologies and, and, and new opportunities. And so in particular, um, our community has had a, this like tremendous shift in focus towards NFTs because of all of the, well, first there's a new collector base. Uh, there are, uh, there are less gatekeepers in the NFT space right. uh, and there's tremendous opportunity for collaboration. And so we have really embraced the NFT space. Um, we're doing our best to educate all sorts of artists. Our community is 100% free to join. In fact, in joining the, the community and going through the process, you're granted some coin. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll stop there and see if you want to guide the co conversation in a different direction. Sure. And, and thank you for sharing um, more context on what had happened and kind of your evolution to becoming an artist, you know, initially a tech entrepreneur. And then, you know, this, this incident happens with you. It spreads like wildfire. It goes absolutely bonkers viral. Search engines keep it at the top of the results and you're at the top of the news cycle. And, and essentially you became canceled right before the cancel movement was really there. Um, it, so you became canceled. And you took that negative energy and recoiled and used it to repurpose yourself, reinvent yourself and harness the very thing that took you crashing to the ground to really lift you to, to entirely new heights by becoming an artist. Yeah, I would, I would say that's accurate. I mean, I, I'm still on my artistic journey. I'm by no, I'm nowhere near where I want to be or where we're going, uh, as a community. Um, but I was, I was canceled and me too at the same time right, right, right. Um, because someone took a picture of me without my permission and posted it on the internet, a picture and a video of me naked and posted it on the internet. And so I experienced kind of like the weight of the internet's thrust of negativity on someone. And it allowed me to develop a bit of a thick skin and be a little bit more, a little bit less risk adverse. And I, I that, that kind of shows up in some of my art. So you're looking at my social media like, I've been featured in a book called How to Become a Successful Artist. My studio practice is making and selling these upcycled artworks. So we go to flea markets. We have this network of artists all over the world that go to flea markets, buy flea market art, inventory it into our system. We then mock up aesthetic trends onto that flea market work. Once we have a collector in mind, we then make the work and then it gets distributed from our network of studios. Um, what I really like about that practice is we're upcycling and we're recycling and it has kind of like this accessible price point, this contemporary aesthetic, but also is rooted in kind of a, a sustainable design. Um, yeah. You know what, one of the things I, I really, um, love that I had seen about your background is a little bit. Uh, for a little bit was that you had taken a hiatus and decided, hey, I'm not sure what I want to do at this point because my world came crashing down. I'm going to go on a journey of self-discovery and just do some apprenticeships, right? And, and you spent some time with a butcher, with a DJ, a graffiti artist, the sailboat captain, um, and, and really learned that you know, the value for you was the process of doing something that would lead to happiness as opposed to the, you know, the, the tangible things and, and the monetary value that you had put on things prior. Yeah. It, um, being, being able to witness folks like a butcher, a DJ, a graffiti artist, a sailboat captain, and see that they were like ir irrationally passionate about their, their work, even though it wasn't like high it wasn't being compensated by society at the level of like value that they were creating made me re rethink my own value structure and start to think about like okay so what is it that i can do that isn't focused on power acquisition and money acquisition but actually allows me to build a community of people around me that support me and that provide me with that irrational passion that I found in those other folks. And so that's where, that's kind of where the, the title of artist came from. I went, I wanted to go from drunk naked founder to something else. And that was the most famous artist. And then the role of artist is a little bit more, it's a little bit less brittle than the role of CEO. CEO is easy to scrutinize. 
everyone wants everyone wants to take you down. Whereas artists are given this leeway to really like start conversations and to be a mirror through which society can reflect on itself. Um, so I'm really enjoying this role as artist, and more than and and I'm and I'm more than anything, I'm enjoying seeing a community of artists around me thrive, and that has a lot to do with the NFT space. Right. And especially, you know, we touched on it, but a lot of the things that you did that went absolutely viral were because they evoked conversation and they were experiential, right? And um, with COVID hitting, obviously you can't do that to the same degree you had prior. So NFTs are, are a good medium for you to be able to continue that and kind of do some new things with what you do, which is, uh, in my opinion, I see the the way that you're able to leverage the headline and the discussion as a big intrinsic part of the art as opposed to just the visuals or the experience itself. And one thing I haven't been able to do enough of to date is use this superpower and this art practice and our studio to bring awareness to issues that really matter. There's been some like really snarky and satirical work in the past, but what I'm realizing is that that it it's kind of my responsibility to start using my platform and my understanding of how to use the media to tell stories to start to bring attention to things that matter and that's kind of why we've we've arrived at this particular project awesome dr sarkis if if you could we touched on the gut brain axis and some of the new methodologies and treatments that are are emerging could you highlight some of those specifically and and kind of where we're at as far as um, acceptance to the greater medical community with regards to what's possible. Yeah, so so maybe just a, a little bit of background uh, and something I learned uh, over the years doing the research is that there's just a tremendous amount of communication between our intestines and our brain it goes in both directions. Right? And so we eat certain things, molecules that our bacteria digest from uh, the, uh, the diet that we intake are transported into our bodies and actually get into our brain and affect brain function, something that we're really interested in. And it also goes the other way, right? So, you know, when we have a thought, let's say that makes us anxious, it's not like our brain hurts, or we, we get butterflies in our, in our, you know, in our belly, in our intestines. And so there's this, you know, really this dynamic communication um, between the two organs that again, you know, as we started uh, doing the work became really important in trying to understand how bacteria that live in the gut can access the brain. And again, the back, it's not that the bacteria themselves travel to the brain, they just send their, their products, their molecules, their signals and information. And it's really that context uh, that we're trying to harness and, and, and understand and then leverage in the laboratory and the clinic to help people, right? So if there are ways of helping people with anxiety and depression, or you know, maybe um, you know, individuals, as we'll talk about with autism spectrum disorder, even neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, seem to have a, a role uh, in ways that the, the microbiome and the gut uh, 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 you know, regulate or, or affect. And again, this is a, a new way of thinking. And, and, and really, as you said, in terms of, of being able to do something about this, what do traditional pharmaceutical companies and drug developers do to address you know, diseases of the brain or conditions of the brain is that they try and get drugs into the brain, right? And this is very hard, right? It's very hard to get molecules in the right. Right concentrations in the right places uh, to do, you know, what they're intended to do and not have side effects. So, so many of these neurological drugs, whether it's like melatonin or, 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 or you know, um, uh, you know, anti -Pro Prozac, antidepressants, or even, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, targeted therapies, they have really severe side effects. So our approach, our vision is that instead of getting drugs into the brain to help with, you know, mental health and, and other conditions, that we're just going to get drugs into the gut or actually use the bacteria that are already in the gut to, you know, change the chemistry in the brain in a way that's favorable, right? And so again, our research is in preclinical models. So we use mostly rodent models, but uh, the work that we've, we've done and the discoveries we've made are now being translated into the clinic. There are a number of clinical trials going on um, that uh, are using this approach. Again, much easier to get drugs into the gut than in the brain. And again, based on this rich communication, the bacteria just do the work. That's fascinating. I'm sure it gives a lot of hope to people that, you know, had situations that seemed like they were, um, you know, difficult to manage, as you had said, not easy to get chemicals into the brain. Um, so 
together collectively, you know, you guys have worked on a project, Maddie Mo, you decided to leverage your talents and your skill set as an artist that can generate headlines and provoke thought um, to do something new and, and kind of push the boundaries of the NFT space and uh, would like to actually present it to our DAO for the whale community directly. So I'd love to give you guys the opportunity to show this and I'm going to add your deck to the screen here. You guys could take it away. Great. Um, we'll make we'll make this brief. Um but we are making a like kind of a presentation of the whale community uh, seeking your support. Uh, I'm going to talk you through what we're doing here and um, we'll, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So the question is, what is valuable? You've seen that as a theme throughout my art practice. Um, what's interesting about art is that it can force us to look closer at what disgusts us and challenges our systems of value. Don't know who said that, but it seems like an appropriate quote for today. Um, human biological material or biological human material uh, has a history of provoking the question, what is valuable? So there's a couple examples that we drew inspiration from. In 1961, an artist called Manzoni actually took a shit in a can and sold it, and it's now in the Tate's permanent collection. Uh, Marcel Duchamp put a urinal into an art show and called it art and started the Dada movement. And others have worked with human material to create art that stimulates serious discussion and has been recognized by the art canon as important works of art. So um, what's interesting is that our bowel movements are often these private and hushed affairs. I will say I've had digestive issues and it's been absolutely debilitating. The taboo of poo has meant literally flushing away critical data that will help us understand health and pathology. And that's why we've got uh, a doctor on the stage with us to tell us more about that. So um, what we're trying to do is shift the paradigm from revulsion to a renaissance, a renaissance of information, uh, a renaissance of opportunity, both in the health and research space, but also in the NFT space and its relation to the art world. So interesting fact, 38 trillion bacteria alone live within and on us in our microbiome. The majority reside in our gastrointestinal tract and they're, dis they're disrupting everything we know about biology and traditional frameworks for health. It's something like 50% of our entire cell count is made up of these bacteria. And I, I'm, I may have misquoted, we'll have, to, we'll have to check with the doctor after. Um, so I'm Matty Mo. Uh, yeah, just a, just a, sorry if I'm interrupting, Matty, but you're right. About half of the cells in our body, over half the cells in our body are, are of microbial origin, which is crazy. To think. Wow. Um, so we've we've teamed up, um, and I'm I'm gonna keep going and get get into the details. So I told you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm known for creating large scale spectacles that inspire people to to question things. Um, I founded a social token powered art community. Um, our goal is to accelerate the career of 10,000 artists. In short, I mess with the art world in a big way. Um, so what if we could apply NFTs, my art platform, uh, to science and fund the next uh, frontier of human health? And so here's the idea. We're going to make an NFT and it's going to be minted. Uh, it's going to be minted on my account, the most famous artist, and it's comprised of my human fecal matter. I've... Uh, created a physical digital one-to-one. -one. So there will be a digital NFT that the first buyer, whoever wins the auction, also gets a 14.968 kilogram layered glass sculptural object that's going to be photographed by 360 cameras and made into an NFT. They'll, they'll get the NFT and they'll get the actual sculpture. Um, a bit about the material, we're calling it the most shittiest NFT 
if you go to Instagram and you look up the hashtag, the most shittiest NFT, our community has already started to promote this thing where we're taking pictures of ourselves on the toilet, looking down at our feet, saying we're in the studio making art because that was quite literally my process for this. Um, the materials used are museum quality. So we've got my human fecal matter. We've got a gelatin capsule. Um, we've got glass. Uh, it's going to weigh just under 15 kilograms. It's going to be 177.8 millimeters by 177.8 millimeters, 19 layers of glass fabricated by one, like a great art fabrication studio. Uh, this will be in the permanent collection of a museum someday, assuming that I continue to become the most famous artist. I can say that for sure. And here's the kicker, a hundred percent of the sale minus platform fees are going towards a microbiome research grant focused on the gut brain access and the autism spectrum disorder. And Dr. Sarkis will help point that money in the correct direction. And because we're on the blockchain, we're going to be able to make all of that publicly visible and hundred percent transparent. So um, without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Sarkis Mazmeyman, Mazmey, Nian, sorry, Dr. Sarkis Mazmeyan. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. And you're not the first to, to butcher yeah. my name. It, it, ha it happens often. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the microbiome. So th these are some some headlines from work that we've done. Um, and But this is, a, a you know, again, it, just like the community that, that Maddie described, it's a growing community of, of scientists that are really interested in poop essentially and, and, and the power of, of of our fecal matter more particularly what are those living organisms that are affecting our biology so profoundly that live in our intestines and again we're largely ignored by the scientific community uh until just the last few years and so maybe for the next slide maddie if we um sort of just think about uh Again, what are the parameters? What, what's the magnitude of our association with these alien organisms, right? So again, you know, somewhere between 30 and 100 trillion bacteria live in our bodies, most of, of which are, are in our intestines, but our skin, our oral cavity, vaginal cavity, um, upper airways are just teeming with microbes, right? So, you, you know, and when we first started this work, it, it's interesting because you know, I think people are very, were very willing to accept that microbes can shape aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, right? But we're just one more environment for bacteria. So they shape us, but they shape us in terms of our biology and in terms of our health. And uh, again, this is, you know, these are, you know, uh, findings and, and, and uh, outcomes that we're just realizing now, just how profound this, this alien organ system is right, to, to our biology. And again, as we already said, there's more bacterial cells in our body than human cells, right? And in fact, more DNA in our microbiome, which is a collective genomes of our bacteria than our own DNA. And so it's really so this, this collaboration between us and bacteria, between our DNA and their DNA that make us human, that make us healthy, that make us who we are, and potentially even affect the way, the way we think and decisions that we make. And as I said, certain, you know, neurological diseases. And uh, again, you know, this, this collection of, of organisms, you know, again, over a thousand different strains of bacteria that live in each of us really does function like an organ, right? So it has the metabolic capacity of our liver and actually weighs, you know, very similar to, to that of the adult brain. Right. And so it just didn't come from us. It came from the environment, but it, they live inside of us. And again, they just work with our uh, with our body the same way all of our internal organs do. And so just for the, the next slide um, is that we uh, again, our lab, our, our, you know, here at Caltech in Pasadena, California, uh, and now many other laboratories around the world have really started to explore. So what are the boundaries by which the microbiome affects human biology? Again, a lot of this work is done in, in, in model systems, right? Sometimes flies, worms, a lot of work done in, in animal rodent models, as I've already mentioned, but now more and more research done in humans that have linked the microbiome to, uh, as we talked about, all, uh, autism, uh, but also uh, other conditions that, that we all can, can relate to, right? So, you know, anxiety, depression, mood, affect, um, even even learning and decision-making, cognition have been, have been, you know, linked or related to the microbiome, as well as 
very, you know, traumatic, uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But beyond the, the brain, you know, our metabolic system, so diabetes, obesity, have been, you know, really closely tied to, to the function of our microbiomes, and uh, as well as immunologic disorders, right, inflammatory bowel disease. So Maddie, Maddie mentioned, you know, he's had some digestive issues. Again, you know, it's just a large number of people that, that either have transient uh, digestive issues or in some cases, you know, chronic ones that last their entire lives, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or... or or irritable bowel syndrome, all somehow the microbiome is, 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 you know, affected. And so what happens in our microbiome is that, uh, you know, unlike the cells of our body, of course, our microbiome isn't fixed. I think that's a good thing. But the, the, the negative part about it is, is that when our microbiome is sort of off kilter, right, or if it, if it gets disturbed in a way that uh, doesn't allow it to perform its natural function, then things go awry in the rest of our bodies, right? And so we really think that's sort of the fundamental basis of many human diseases and even just day-to-day -day conditions. Like they said, just, you know, why do I have brain fog today? You know, maybe, you know, I ate something that changed my microbiome in a way that altered the chemical signals between the gut and the brain. So something that we're, we're really excited about as well. So not just uh, address disease, right? Which in some ways is, is you know, more obvious, but even just day-to-day -day, day -day life. Um, and so on the next slide, uh, you know, th these are some of the mechanisms by which the gut and the brain communicate. I already, you know, described sort of this, this intense dialogue between between the two organs. And this sort of gets really, you know, scientific -y, uh, But, you know, really, uh, you know, there's just a number of molecules and cells and nerves that connect our, our gut and our brain. And again, you know, if you just think back to, to everyday experiences and, you know, even after today, right? So just be aware of how you feel and in you know in your intestines and how you feel mentally right throughout the day throughout your lives i think you'll see that there's a lot of a lot of obvious connections that are there between the, the brain and the body um and in the next slide uh so it's talking specifically about autism and this is something that's near and dear to my heart um we started thinking about whether or not there are ways to intervene and potentially improve the lives of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, and I'll describe the you know the condition in, in, in a minute. But suffice it to say, again, you know, I expect many of us have either know people or know of people uh, that have families uh, with individuals with autism, and this is a growing problem. Again, we don't understand what's go why why this is happening, but there's more and more uh, cases of autism now than there was a generation ago. And certainly more than there were, uh, uh, you know, many decades ago. Um, and of course, if you now think about this construct that I mentioned about our DNA and microbial DNA collaborating to and coming together to make us healthy, you know, it's clear our genomes, our DNA didn't change dramatically in one or two generations, but our microbiomes may have, right? And there's actually evidence that as we live more Western lifestyles, as we live cleaner, take antibiotics, preservatives in our food, you know, certain uh, exposures to chemicals in our environment, our microbiome is changing. So maybe that's an explanation for why autism is, is increasing. It's about 3 million people. We know worldwide, this is probably an underestimate, maybe even, it could be even 10 times that many. The reason for this is that uh, there's no brain scan, there's no blood test for autism. It, it requires a behavioral assessment by very trained caregivers. And so it's very hard to assess autism in the, in, in the developing world. You see this chart here on the right of cases of autism. And again, sort of a, more of a, a, a disease or disorder of, of Western societies because it's largely because we just don't know what's going on in, in the, the, the developing world, as I mentioned. Uh, in the U.S., one in 54 cases of new births result in autism diagnosis. It's a tremendous, in addition to the social and medical burdens, tremendous economic burden uh, as well on families and on, and on society. Um, and, you know, why do we get into this? Why do we even think the microbiome has uh, potentially any role in autism? Is that, you know, surprisingly, you know, more than half, you know, uh, of kids with autism have some form of gastrointestinal symptoms. So you don't really think about this, right? Again, uh, you know, uh, and I'll describe the, the basic core symptoms in a minute, but um, these kids have GI issues. And so I'm wondering why would this neurological behavioral condition manifest or, or or present itself with you know also with with bloating and constipation diarrhea 
And so again, we others have now shown that the microbiome is different in kids with autism compared to matched neurotypical uh, individuals. And so this change may be a, 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 in the microbiome, this, you know, it's the shift away from healthy, if you will, may give us an opportunity to bring the microbiome back to a more healthy state. And again, getting back to that, to the comparison with the human genome, we can't change our DNA easily, but we can change our microbiomes if we knew how. And so that's where the research is going is to understand how the microbiome has changed to promote, uh, you know, uh, you know, symptoms and, and behaviors consistent with autism, and then how do we get it back to a normal, healthy state? Because again, we can access the gut. And then just finally, just in the, in the last slide is, uh, you know, just in terms of, of what autism is, right? It's a, again, a behavioral disorder. It's, it's diagnosed based on deficits in social communication and repetitive behavior, sort of, you know, repeating learned traits, doing things that are comfortable for those individuals. And then, but not transmitting that, not communicating and, and, and interfacing with the world around them. And kids with autism just tend to be, you know, like I said, in their own world. But what's really, and this is how autism is viewed, this is how it's diagnosed, this is how it's treated. But then if you look at it, you know, and, and you talk to families or you, you talk to, to caregivers and, and, and physicians who treat individuals with autism, they'll tell you this is a body, a full body disorder, right? There's gastrointestinal symptoms I mentioned, there's hyperactivity, these kids have seizures, they have, you know, certain developmental issues, motor issues, coordination issues, uh, immune dysfunction. So we really have to start, you know, sort of broadening our, our scope of, of what autism is and not just focusing on the brain, but maybe even treating this as, as again, the disorder of the body, which then gets us back into, into the intestine and, and a way to intervene. And so um, I think with that, we can, uh, uh, um, you know, maybe just end with this one quote, right? Uh, you know, uh, of the fact that, again, it's just, we're just collaborating with the microbes in our bodies and, and we're, you know, we need to help them help us. And so in terms of, of diet, in terms of, of how we, you know, live our lives, the healthier our microbes are, the healthier I believe we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a couple questions come through Nightmare. Did you want to ask uh, those questions? medical uh questions that have come in um and then we could hop back into the deliverables specifically but some people had asked how old is this particular field of research so if you look in the literature you'll you'll find uh writing about the microbiome back into early 1900s so uh ellie mechnikoff who won a nobel prize not for microbiome because he actually didn't study microbiome uh he, said he was studying the immune system when the Nobel Prize, I want to say 1905 or 1908, um, was writing about a group of individuals uh, in a very remote part of uh, the Balkans that, you know, this community of individuals were living into their hundreds. And he went to study them. And the one thing he realized about them is that they would eat a lot of fermented foods. Um, and he really believed those fermented foods with the bacteria was somehow nourishing their microbiomes and, and making these, you know, this community of people live, you know, live, you know, like I said, well into their hundreds. And so uh, a lot of speculation then. But really, the, I would say the modern age of microbiome research is about, you know, 15 years old in, in essence, you know, of course there was some, you know, early work as, as I mentioned that we were doing, but in the past 15 years, it's just been a lot more effort, a lot more uh, research um, and a lot more attention, right? You know, we, like I said, we hear about this, there, Jamie Lee Curtis was selling probiotics, a few right. Years ago, right? This wasn't happening 10 or 15 years ago. Interesting. Someone had asked, um, is it the Western way of living that's bringing about these disorders? Or is that just a matter of where the reporting is based on technological advances within the countries? Yeah, as I just mentioned, you know, in terms of, of you know, diagnosis and incidence, you know, we have a, a better view of the Western world than we do of the developing world. And so, again, it's just, you know, it's just a largely unknown from an autism standpoint. What I can tell you is that individuals that live in less developed societies have more com complex microbiomes, 
right? So they have just, they're just, they have so many different types of, of organisms. And that's viewed as a good thing. Diversity in the microbiome correlates with health. So the less number of species you have, the more likely you are to be diagnosed with a disease than those people who have lots of different types of bacteria. And so the idea there is that the more bacteria you have, the more benefits you can derive from them because each one has their own little function and they all you know, can contribute to various different aspects of health. And again, it's believed that many um, uh, that people that live in, in the developing world have these more complex microbiomes. So we don't know about autism and the rates between the developing and the developed world. But we do know pretty well that like allergies, um, uh, asthma, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, hay fever are just, are, these are diseases of the Western world. Again, that's been tied back to something called the hygiene hypothesis that again, suggests that the more diverse, the more, uh, you know, cl you know, uh, uh, a complex microbiome is the healthier you are, the cleaner you are, the more likely you are to have a disease. Interesting. In, in that vein, uh, is there a dietary correlation with um, the chart that you had shown with the prevalence of autism in Hong Kong and Asia? It's unknown, right? So the basis of, of the, 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 the rates of diagnosis are, are completely unknown. It's like, I mean, people have been banging their heads against this for, for many years now of a, why is it increasing? And B, why is it increasing in certain places, right? And of course, there's a genetic component, a large genetic component to autism. But again, that doesn't explain why, you know, incidence and diagnosis rates change, right? There's something else that contributes to the disorder that's in our environment. And again, we don't know. A diet's a major driver, right, of, of how the microbiome uh, looks. And so, of course, our bacteria eat <laughs> and digest what we put in our bodies before we do. We essentially live off of their byproducts. Uh, and our nutrients come from their leftovers, if you will. And so, you know, obviously diets in different societies may be contributing to the, you know, the different rates uh, of, of disease. But again, at the end of the day, we're still searching for those answers. Great. Someone had actually asked in layman's terms, um, they're trying to understand the differentiation between micro microbial and probiotic. Probiotics are just microbes that have shown beneficial function or believe or presumed to have a beneficial function. Because again, not all microbes are good. In fact, it's really interesting. Very few microbes are actually bad for us. I mean, you know, we're, we're coming out of a pandemic, right? And so, you know, this is on the on the front of most people's minds in terms of viruses and microbes and, and you know, what makes us sick. The vast majority of the microbes that live in the, the world with us do not make us sick. Many of them are actually helpful and beneficial as we've talked about. A small handful actually cause disease. And those are the ones we've been focused on as a medical community. And so what probiotics are, again, are those organisms which have been demonstrated to show some effect um, and are being you know, developed and commercialized. Great. So I wanted to ask, um, can my microbial and probiotic help help with other issues other than the gut and typical mental disorders, anxiety, anything else tertiary that we may not know about? At, at this point, I mean, ev everything is on the table, right? The more research that we do, the more layers uh, of that onion we peel, the more we realize how profoundly bacteria in our intestines affect our, our entire bodies. And so, you know, it, it, we've shown that in our brain, there are many hundreds of chemicals that are produced by bacteria. Right? So again, they're made in the gut, they travel into our brain. This is true of any organ, right? So our, enti our entire bodies are just bathed in the byproducts of our microbes. And so it, it's conceivable that many, many aspects of our physiology, our health are tied, integrally tied to our, to our gut bacteria. What What's the biggest challenge to developing novel microbiome-based treatments? Uh, initially, obviously showing that they work, right? That, you know, uh, that they work at least in certain people. It's probably not gonna be one size fits all. We're also so different in our, you know, DNA and our environments and the food we eat and, and, and the lives we live. So, um, you're gonna have to find the right organism, if you will, with air quotes, um, for each individual. But, you know, in many ways, there's also some commonalities. Like if you just, you know, improve gastric function, you're going to generally improve health, right? 
Um, but, you know, so again, it's, it's identifying those organisms that are really beneficial. And then maybe on a more technical side, I think some of the bigger challenges are in, in manufacturing, right, of making living drugs, right? So the drugs that we're all used to are chemicals, right? They come in, they come from a laboratory. Here, these are living organisms as drugs. And so the entire way that you produce and manufacture them are different. So again, just more on the, uh, on the technical side, that, that still remains uh, one of the biggest challenges. Awesome. Uh, you know what? These are coming in fast and furious. So I'm going to table a, some, uh, a bit of these for the end and we'll, we'll circle back and, and try to address more of the community's concerns. But I'm impressed with the, uh, the depth of the scientific um, levels these people are trying to get to with some of their questions. So uh, again, we'll circle back. But I wanted to make sure we, we could move forward and take a look at you know, what we're going to do to try to get some more research available for this very important topic. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazmanian. That was very helpful. <laughs> um, in summary, uh, we are dropping an NFT, a one of one paired with a physical, physical object on June 29th. We recognize the whale community's influence in the NFT space. So we wanted to help. We wanted to tell our story to you to, to hopefully get your uh, uh your influence to uh help this sale to, to raise money again 100 percent of proceeds will fund a research grant in gut brain and autism spectrum research this was inspired by marcel duchamp's fountain and manzoni's can of shit which remains in the tate's permanent collection um we were doing this commission to communicate the scientific value of shit which is something we've traditionally been wired to think of as disgusting and flush away. Um, and we're doing this through the medium of NFTs, which they, the NFTs themselves have created a global conversation around what creates value. And so the wink is using shit, which is something that's provocative and using a delivery mechanism like NFTs to, to maybe like Trojan horse, a really interesting conversation into the mainstream. We believe this is an interesting way to create like a banana on the wall moment for NFTs while drawing important uh, and attention to scientific messaging around the value of shit and what we could discover uh, through funding research. Um, so while this is all a bit meta, uh, we hope to catalyze important and relevant conversations about art and the disruption of traditional value systems. Um, we're gonna be releasing more and more information related to the actual physical object and the NFT over the next few weeks as we tease this out. We've got uh, major pl press plans. We've got clubhouse rooms planned. We're really trying to make as much noise about this as possible because it, it gives the NFT community an opportunity to show that NFTs and artists and scientists can collaborate for good. Um, so uh, let's change what's valuable and mint new frontiers buy my shit um, so that we can make shit happen. And that uh, that concludes our presentation part of this. Awesome. Um, great conversation piece. People love both the scientific aspect of it and what you're trying to raise you know, money to do research on, as well as the conversation that we're having. Uh, you raise an interesting point with regards to NFT themselves having a conversation in the mainstream with regards to value, right? There's all people saying you can just right click, save as, what's the value in it and things of that nature. And um, that discussion is defended with fervor from our community. Um, and hopefully they have the same openness to having this conversation about what you're trying to do and what you'll be able to deliver uh, if you do. So this is obviously going to be a headline grabbing NFT drop, um, not only because of the nature of what it is, but what your skill set is, which is to dominate the headlines and get on the forefront of conversation. Um, so, so that's uh, a tertiary value to participating and being part of this NFT drop. And likewise, it's the opportunity to do something altruistic. It's 100% of the proceeds going to the research grant, um, specifically targeting autism and what we could do with the, uh, you know, the gut research there. So a lot to digest there. I'm sure the community has a lot of questions and I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between the two of you if you have a bit more time to spend with us. 
Um, one question for you, Maddie. Curating and solution selling the, the desired response is a skill that you're amazing at. What would you say to people that would question your authenticity with this project because of your previous works? Sure. I think authentic is a funny word. Like, for example, if you ask someone when's the last time they had Chinese food, they might say yesterday. But was it authentic Chinese food? Was it made by a, by a person who is in China using Chinese ingredients? Or is it a, a blend of American food and Chinese food? And so this argument around authenticity is one I don't really engage in because I truly believe authenticity is a figment of our imaginations. We are one microbiome together on this planet and we're all kind of borrowing and remixing because without the invention of the wheel, we would not have had the car. And without the invention of the car, we would not have had Uber. And without the invention of Uber, I would not be getting my lunch delivered today via Grubhub. So I'm just, I kind of don't like participating in this idea that people are authentic or inauthentic, realizing that we're all evolving. And that is the natural, that's a natural part of an artist's life. And that's a natural part of everyone's lives. Right. I think I, I read a quote from you, um, from a recent interview where you had mentioned kind of the post COVID world that you're in and for all intents and purposes, you had said the most famous artist as a headline generating satirist is dead. And now you've moved on to trying to be more impactful from this skill set and what you can leverage. And obviously, you know, here you're trying to do something great for the scientific community. Dr. Sarkis, someone had asked, is there any controversy with regards to this research and its application, or is it universally accepted by the medical community? Yeah, I think it's dangerous to universally accept anything uh, until until there's been enough research to validate that, you know, validate, you know, the, the understanding or the findings. And so, you know, anything, any new discovery, new area of research should always be viewed with, with you know, skepticism, but maybe healthy skepticism, right? So we want to be able to empower new research, people to, to sort of push the boundaries and, and take the data in directions that they haven't been taken because that's where the breakthroughs happen. That's where the, the, the transformations happen. So we can't be too conservative, but we also can't follow every you know new idea that, that, that that's you know proposed, right? So the balance is making sure that initially we're open-minded, but that the research is grounded in really rigorous science and then time will tell. And so I think that's where we are with with this research. That's why the funds will be will be so helpful, and I think be you know so impactful is that they'll push that boundary, they'll push that frontier for us to get that answer. Right, right, Maddie. A question for you: NFTs are in the crosshairs by mainstream media. What would you say is the um, the perspective people should take that are concerned about the optics of this and making it a forefront headline grabbing event? I think because it's going towards scientific research, it's an opportunity for NFTs to become less villainized and less dismissed and more looked at as a vehicle through which good and change can happen. Um, so while we're Trojan horsing these really big ideas, it's kind of necessary to play the media's game if you want a global stage and a global audience. And we want to give this cause a global stage and a global audience. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I've, I've not seen many NFT projects that could have impact like this one could. Um, and I would like to encourage more artists to collaborate with scientists to create impact using the format of NFTs. On a related note, someone had mentioned that you are obviously very skilled at generating the headlines and getting at the forefront of the news cycle. Um, how do you feel that you could help shape the narrative in a positive light for this? Well, I, I will say that we've been working on this for many weeks, if not months. Um, and it's a hundred percent of the proceeds are being donated. I've used my studio's time, my resources to make this happen. But in addition to, a, a number of other folks involved. The a company Seed is helping commission this. Um, we basically, I, I want to do good. And, and it's up to people to determine whether or not that this is going to be good. And at the end of the day, the artist makes the work and the viewer finishes it. I kind of started with that. And it's up to the viewer to decide what to make of this. I can tell you that 
My hope is that many hundreds of thousands of dollars are raised through the sale of one F NFT that becomes headline grabbing, that makes a lot of people go, what the heck are NFTs? Also, didn't know gut brain research was so important. And gosh, that most famous artist guy got us again. <laughs> like, that's gonna right, happen. Right. <laughs> Dr. Sarkis, uh, I digress on a little bit, but something that's come up quite a few times from our community, um, they're asking what is the best way to increase that, biome, that gut biome diversity in a healthy way? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's it's hard it's hard to, to, again, generalize between the population, but so I can tell you what the, what associations guide our decision making in terms of, of what, what increased diversity is that people who eat very complex um, uh, carbohydrates, or, or, or more, I have a more of a, a, of a sort of a, a non-animal uh, based diet tend to have more diverse microbiomes. And so again, the, the foundation of this argument is that diversity in your microbiome, diversity in the community of organisms correlates with health. So how do you get to that point? Is you eat a lot of a lot of um, uh, starches and a lot of uh, carbohydrates. So, I mean, again, think of this as, as a Mediterranean diet, if you will, right? Um, very, you know, limited in, in animal products. And so that gets you to diversity, right? Um, there are other ways of doing this. There are obviously probiotics, you know, the seed was just mentioned, you know, they have probiotics with many dozens of organisms and that that's one other way to increase diversity. But at the, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be individualized and people need to sort of, you know, go through trial and error, right? So alter their food, alter their diet, you know, maybe supplement with probiotics, you know, make sure that you get rest and, and exercise. The obvious things, the things that actually your doctor will tell you, but never is not thinking about the microbiome when they're telling you this, you're essentially providing health to your microbiome. And by doing that, you know, and, and being mindful of the effects of that, I think one can then personalize the effects of the microbiome for themselves. But again, at the end of the day, we're going, to, it, it, it comes down to just living a healthy life. Awesome. Someone actually made a comment that's near and dear to my heart. They said, what about pineapple pizza? So hopefully that's on the good list and I can continue having my stance as controversial as it may be. Um, Maddie, someone had asked with, or actually for both of you, um, with the breadth of influence the gut biome has on various, you know, mental functions and disease, why autism for this particular drop? Is there a personal connection or rationale that you guys, uh, wanted to hone in on? Maddie? Um, I think it's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Sarkis, but it's clear that autism is influenced by the microbiome and it feels like actionable research that can be done and make a big impact. Um, we are we are thinking about gut, uh, mind-gut research with a focus on autism. It's ultimately going to be up to Dr. Sarkis where these funds get directed. Um, but that was kind of the initial thinking is just to be able to make as big an impact as possible in a tangible way. That's right. And then I think as I alluded to, you know, the field is on the precipice of making really important discoveries in the next few years. Right. But, and we don't, you know, have those answers yet, but we're poised now to, to answer those questions again of how one can, can improve you know, health. And again, we're also thinking about not just infectious disease these days, but we're thinking about mental health, right, because of, of the pandemic. Uh, but in terms of autism, for, for me personally, you know, it started off as a scientific curiosity, but as getting to know families, getting to know individuals that are affected. I mean, this is, you know, really, it turns people's lives upside down, right? Uh, you know, once, once they or their child gets a diagnosis. And, you know, there's a, a lot of emotions involved. Um, and the other aspect of this is that people sort of question themselves, right? parents question themselves of what they did or did not do, you know, that results in this diagnosis. And in many ways, I think the research can help answer those questions. Autism, to me, isn't a disease or a disorder. It's a, it's a state of condition, right, that, you know, it's a different way of being, right? But what I think is really problematic in the field is the lack of answers, right? If, let's say this was you know, some other disorder where I can tell you, oh, well, you have cancer and I can, you know, just remove it, right? Or do something, uh, you know, or maybe not something else. It almost feels more real because there's, you know, a line of 
at least there's things you won't, you won't be able to do to address that. With autism, people are just left scratching their heads, right? Of wondering where it came from, what is it, what do I do, right? And to me, that makes it a more complex problem and a more interesting and challenging problem. Thank you both for, for that insight. One question I had for Maddie from the community was, um, you know, a lot of people that may not be familiar that you were the person behind some of these big headline grabbing events are now looking at your artwork. They've asked, can you share your opinion on appropriation and derivative works or what some would call trash art? Sure. And, and, uh, and I'm sure you're, from, I, I hope you're familiar with that term and don't think I'm disparaging anything. That's literally a categorization of a very sought after you know, NFT subgenre. Yeah, there's a, there's an artist called Noah Purfoy who lived in the desert in Joshua Tree and he invented this movement called Junk Dada where he was literally taking stuff from a junkyard and making sculptures out of that. And to me, that was like, that was a cool hustle. It's like it did, having access to the right materials didn't stop him from expressing himself creatively. And I think as, as I've grown as an artist and as, as I've watched other artists grow, we're all kind of appropriating to a certain degree. For example, when you learn handwriting or cursive handwriting as a child, you're copying the letters and tr on tracing paper to then learn how to develop your own style. So to a certain degree, all artists start out by appropriating or copying or, or interacting with aesthetics that they're interested in to then develop an authentic voice over time. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to get there. And so regarding trash art, I think it's, it's like one step in an artist process and it may be the greatest art of the NFT movement. Um, but that, will only be told through time. Um, I hope that addressed the question and if there's any clarifications needed, I'd be happy to make them. Sure, thank you so much. Someone had mentioned you talk about the support of your greater artist community. What is the size and scope of that right now? Yeah, so we, uh, we have more than, I wanna say 700 holders of our token on rally.io, Artcoin. Um, we have, more than 500 people in our Discord channel. We have around 300 people who have been onboarded into the community and actively participate in projects. And to give you a sense, our last project, which was a drop of Grimes portraits, we had 105 artists participate. Um, so we were able to activate 105 artists to participate in a project. Um, we've intentionally kind of throttled onboarding so that we can make the onboarding experience as good as possible and provide as much value and resources up front so that when someone enters the community, they're ready to participate in projects and they're re ready to like upskill themselves to a level with the rest of our community members. Awesome. And I'm sure that uh, there'll be some artists peeling off of the whale community and, and uh, joining you there as well. Um, one thing I, I thought was of note and some of the stuff I had read about some previous projects you had done was when you had written the How I Sold a Million Dollars Worth of Art story, right? Um, your early attempts at art actually had you uh, make a relationship with a gallery by purchasing a piece, held your own show, and, and no one showed up, right? And so um, if I'm recalling this correctly, you then wrote a story about How I Sold a Million Dollars Worth of Art wrote a check to yourself and photographed it that went viral and because of that narrative people wanted to work with you and came to talk to you and, and whatnot and i can't help but draw the correlation here to what we're trying to do for scientific research right you're you're using this vehicle of of evoking discussion and turning heads um and maybe even evoking disgust in some people to get the attention and possibly the sale towards a worthy cause that to be quite honest with you, if it was done in a different way, may not have the same attention, may not get the same number of bids, may not have the same value placed on, you know, participating. So I can definitely see how you are leveraging what you do now for this purpose. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea is art is about storytelling and art, it, art, it allows for stories to be told across race, religion, creed, sect, sex, everybody, everybody can relate to an art object. And what's cool is that we're creating an art object that quite literally everyone can relate to because everyone has a microbiome.
and and we can we can all relate to this art object uh, and and hopefully start discussions around this art object that leads to microbiome research. Awesome. Uh, so I think that's it. We covered a lot of good questions from the community. There were some that were very nuanced, Dr. Sarkis, about uh, um, microbiology and you know gut health that we may, I don't know, maybe we'll follow up with you with an email and see if you have some resources for the community because this seems to be um, right up their alley, no pun intended. But uh, um, with regards to the drop itself, um, the 29th is the date. And uh, have you guys decided on the platform? We are choosing between OpenSea and Foundation with the caveat that we know less funds will be donated to the organization of Dr. Sarkis's choosing if we go on Foundation because the, fee, the fees are higher over there um, or Maker's Place. Uh, we're, in, we're, we're trying to figure that out now. Um, it would be my Genesis drop on Maker's Place. Um, I've got a presence on Foundation and I have a pretty strong presence on OpenSea. Um, we haven't quite figured out how long the auction is. If there's any collectors in the audience who'd like to speak directly with me about the, the project, ha I'd be happy to speak with you. You can reach out to me, maddie at themostfamousartist.com. What we're trying to do is over the next two weeks, drum up interest and demand so that we can actually have kind of like a thrilling uh, theatrical auction take place that can then help uh, distribute this story through the mainstream media and, and result in a meaningful amount of money being raised. Very cool. So um, you actually appeal directly to the whale community and the whale DAO. So from a process standpoint, uh, I believe a proposal will be drafted in the coming days and it will go to, uh, you know, our mechanisms that we have for the community to vote. There'll be a lot of robust discussion that I'm sure you may want to see and uh, will be valuable to you as well. And uh, we'll see we'll th where this goes. But fascinating discussion. Um, I'm very interested to see where this goes within the greater NFT community and, and hopefully, you know, wish you guys the most success and amazing auction and a great uh, stipend to put into the grants and uh, get Dr. Serkis some more research opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bridging the gap between art and science. No, thank you guys for everything that you're doing. And thank you for not putting pineapple pizza on the naughty list so I can continue to uh, to praise it and push it on our community. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you.